Ever since the first man stood here, thousands of years ago on the white cliffs of Cape Blancnez and looked at the cliffs of Dover, the challenge to cross the channel has beckoned generations. Now, thousands cross the 37 kilometer channel every day by ship, jet boat, and hovercraft, all still subject to the whims of the sea like the ancient sailing ships. The story of the Channel Tunnel spans two centuries. 1802, a Napoleon-backed tunnel. 1803, a submerged tube, Tessier de Motre. 1867, Tom de Grammont, a proposed rail tunnel. 1880, Colonel Beaumont's pneumatic TBM bored over 2,000 meters near Dover for a rail tunnel. 1891, a combined bridge and tunnel scheme. 1938, Bostevant's double deck road and railway tunnel. 1974, a tunnel at Shakespeare Cliff. 1986, a binational consortium, Euro Tunnel, won the concession to build and operate a twin bore rail tunnel. At $9.6 billion, it is the largest privately financed civil project ever. Transmanche Link a joint venture of 10 British and French contractors is the builder. The gray chalk that extends from the cliffs of Dover to Blocknez is water permeable. The next layer of blue chalk is non-permeable, but near the French coast, a fracture zone crosses the chalk strata. The village of saint is the hub of the entire French effort. From this shaft, 75 meters deep and 55 meters in diameter, three tunnels will go landward and three towards the sea. The two rail tunnels are 8.8 .8 meters in diameter and the pilot tunnel 5.6 meters. From here, the three seaward tunnels must be driven through the permeable gray chalk to reach the blue chalk. Then, tunnelers confront nearly two kilometers of fractures. On the British side, the blue chalk extends well inland. The problem there is unmapped boreholes the specter of encountering high-pressure water dictated unprecedented machine design specifications. And the main problem is the problem of the seal. They are afraid of the pressure when we are, uh, you, you know, in the middle of uh, the channel. They, we shall have a pressure of around 10, 11 bar. The machine must not only be able to take the pressure, but keep on going. The specs also required a high rate of advance. We can get the segment set in 15 minutes. I think we'll have that problem not. We got it made. Yeah. What do you think? Are you able to make 600 more, uh, 600 meter per month? Of course. In four shifts, three shifts to work in and one shift uh, for maintenance. But certainly at three sets an hour, uh, that's going to easily give us the 600 meters per month that we need. Of course, that's going to be a a big challenge. To the Robbins Company, located near Seattle, USA, this is the project of the century. They have spent decades working on the challenge. They were ready when Transmarsh Link ordered the pilot tunneling machine T1. By probing through the machine, we can easily detect faults in the ground. Once the faults are detected, the machine is equipped to drill a series of holes to inject quick-setting grout. In manufacturing this machine, new standards of excellence were set, and a global approach was taken to integrate the most advanced tunneling technology in the world. The company joined forces with Markham in Britain to build two of the large undersea machines, and Robbins joint ventured with Kawasaki to build the large undersea machines on the French side. Robbins also licensed some soft ground technology from Komatsu for T1. The premise that T1 would be underground and subjected to seawater immersion for years mandated the highest quality materials and workmanship. 
both Robbins workers and subcontractor employees took great pride and care to do the job right. Three sixteenths? Well, we can come out this way a little. Yeah, come out and bring it up. No. Okay. We can rotate it the other end because we got a boot down there. We can ro rotate it down there. Components came from Japan as well as Europe. Fabrication of heavy machine parts and the actual assembly took place in Portland, Oregon. It was often seven days a week, working around the clock for Robbins people and many of their subcontractors. The difficult part will be to detect old boreholes that have not been properly filled. Uh, what happens if we, during the course of the drilling, actually intersect one of those holes that hasn't been properly plugged? It will be a sudden inrush of water that will try to force its way into the tunnel with as much as 12 times atmospheric pressure. The machine is designed to self-seal within 20 seconds, but this is not enough. It must continue to move forward. Well, of course, that's why we have the criteria that the machine uh, has the capability of boring under a hydrostatic pressure. In the normal open mode, the cuttings pass through a screw conveyor and drop onto a flight conveyor. Under pressure, in the closed mode, the cuttings go into a piston discharge pump that relieves the pressure and drops the material onto the conveyor. There are other significant differences. During the advance in the open mode, grippers in the rear shield extend against the tunnel wall and thrust jacks propel the cutter head forward. The shield remains stationary, thus allowing for simultaneous cutter head advance and segment setting. In the closed mode, the advance is cyclic. Propel shoes push against the concrete segments to advance the cutter head. Segment placement must wait for the advance to be completed. Conversely, advance must wait for the segment ring to be erected. To operate in the closed mode, T1 must also be able to completely seal itself. In effect, T1 has the water resisting capability of a World War II submarine and can continue boring through the fractured rock. Then uh, how many places do you intend to seal the machine? The major seal points are the cutter head seals, the large rotary seals on the cutter head, the articulation seals on the two shields, and the seals between the tail shield and the tunnel lining. The most difficult sealing problem is between the shield and the tunnel lining. This is the seal we intend to use. It's a wire brush type seal developed by a Japanese contractor. What uh, happens when there's a failure of one of the seals? Bob, there's four rows of seals. The outermost row wears the most, so there's three backup seals. As the completed segment is pushed out of the shield by the advancing machine, rings of wire brush squeeze tight against it, forming a pressure-tight seal. This joint is the most vulnerable since it is under constant wear and tear and rubs against the lining as the shield advances. These seals are designed for replacement. Because of the importance of T1 to the entire project, this machine was subject to intense scrutiny by Transmanche Link. During the testing period, senior members of TML watched closely. The motors are on the refrigerator? Yes, the motors are on the refrigerator. Okay. So my thought is that maybe we could uh, put the disc cutters in the center because they, they're just going to push the muck yes, out of the way. Yes, but you are not afraid that the space between the disc will be filled with material. I really don't think so. I think because the material is all going to gravitate from the center outward anyway. Well, good. Who have a Rolls-Royce, you? This machine. No, this machine is all right. 
Yes. Looks so. Sure. It's American Rolls Royce. Or American Cadillac, if you prefer. This is historic because this job has been planned for 150 years and it's actually going to be built this time. We've been looking forward to this, getting this machine completed and loaded on board the ship and on its way to France, of course, for many months. But it's kind of the culmination of an effort that's been many, many years uh, in, in coming. My father consulted with the original modern planners in the late 50s and was one of the few people to actually get underground and see the old tunnel which was built almost 100 years ago. I know he'd have been very proud to be part of it. The technology that we've developed in recent time has really uh, made this different nature of a job. In 1974, we built a tunneling machine for this job, also for the French side. We built the machine and shipped it over to France, and it never got underground before the job. Very tricky or treacherous geology on the French side as you head westward. But this machine has been very, very specially designed for going through that bad ground. And it's going to be very wet. It's going to be water under very high pressure. Tunneling machines have been used for wet tunneling uh, and underwater pressure, but never at more than about half the pressure this machine will see. And it's a very long tunnel. It'll be the longest undersea tunnel ever built. So we've got a job which is basically dry rock, which we're going to be boring. And part of it's going to start out in very wet material uh, that might even be like soil and the water may be directly connected to the seabed. So we've got uh, water pressure that's very, very high, a maximum of 300 feet of head. So the machine has to operate in all those conditions. And it just depends on how well you do that job of designing a machine with special features to solve the geological problems on the job that uh, determines how inexpensively the tunnel can be built. And it's a very, very important thing on this job because it's a commercial tunnel. So it has to be built at the lowest possible cost. T1 is set on guide rails. It is then skidded into the starter tunnel. Once in place, the first of 17 gantries follow. The train of gantries is 270 meters long and carries the machine's support systems, including the hydraulic power units, electrical cabinets and transformers, ventilation and grouting systems, dewatering pumps, scrubbers, air compressors, workshop, infirmary, and even a lunchroom. This dripping gray chalk face shows its permeability despite a protective grout curtain ahead. T1 operated in the open mode for only 20 meters. This underscores the difficult geology on the French side, where the machine must penetrate past the permeable chalk and then deal with nearly two kilometers of badly fractured blue chalk. As the spoil is removed, concrete segments come in on the segment conveyor. They are fed to a vacuum segment erector, which picks them up and rotates them into position. There are two erectors, one for each side, allowing near simultaneous placement. The segments are bolted into place to form the tunnel lining behind the shield. The segments are manufactured on site. Transmanche Link uses a highly efficient system to ensure that all five headings will have a constant supply of segments.
Initial progress was slow. As with all pioneering technologies, T1 experienced startup problems that were aggravated by treacherous geology. At Gantry 9, the segments are lifted, turned, and set on the overhead conveyor that sends them to the erectors. When the operator detects water at the face, he can quickly switch to the closed mode. Here, the propel shoes are pushing against the concrete ring. In this mode, the cylinders must retract before segment placement can start. The new ring will allow another advanced stroke. During the advance, the belt conveyor moves the muck to rail cars. The loaded muck train speeds to the shaft where it is dumped. In the lower level, a computerized plant turns the muck from all five headings into a slurry. The slurry is pumped to a settling lagoon. Across the channel, in Chesterfield, England, designed by Robbins and manufactured by Markham's, jointly managed from the Robbins-Markham Joint Venture Office here in Chesterfield. The backup gear is designed by the Robbins-Markham Joint Venture and extends for some 210 metres. There are certain features of the machines which are unique to this machine. The over-design and large safety factors in the machine are mainly due to the possibility of meeting uh, an open borehole that would result in a 12 bar hydrostatic pressure on the machine. This equates to a 7,500 ton force trying to push the machine back down the tunnel. At the same time in Dunkirk, France, T3 is also nearing completion. Oh, but, but the front shield was built at uh, Harima Works. Uh, we have pieces coming from many parts of Europe, yeah. and the uh, 
gear reducers came from Germany. Yes, Lucian. And uh, electric motors from uh, Austria. Aileen. Austria. Uh -huh. yeah. So uh, the cutters, uh, of course, the, the disc cutters came from Seattle. Yeah. The conception is same as T1. This one, this is conception is same as T1. Yes. At the T1 heading, advance rates have increased as man and machine work in seamless partnership. challenge of centuries is being met. There will be six machines boring beneath the channel. Five of them bear the robin's name. Well, the machine design is basically the same as the C1 design, with the exception of the fact that... We have grippers in both forward and rear shoes. Yeah. Well, it's a lot bigger machine than uh, T1, but uh, there's still not much more room. When I was in Kobe for the tests, they had a, a very detailed plan for the field assembly and startup program. It looks like they're uh, right on schedule. With the backup equipment for T3 and for this machine were all built over in, in Dunkirk. So that part of the equipment's French, French made. Yeah. Also, the electrics and hydraulics for this machine are built here in France. Well, it didn't look like that last time you saw it. No. At uh, <laughs> Kobe. No. Well, it's only going to be a matter of weeks until yeah. this machine is up to the page, ready to, ready to go to work. Yeah, it won't be long now. Sure, everybody's getting excited.